Hello and welcome to Cinematic Excrements. Today we continue our quest to review every movie that has won the Razzie for Worst Picture. The year was 1991, and the film was Hudson Hawk, starring Bruce Willis. Willis' star was on the rise going into the early 90s, largely thanks to the success of Die Hard and its sequel, Die Hard 2, which came out in 1990. And as many have pointed out, Die Hard 2 was in fact directed by Rennie Harlan, the same guy who directed 1990's worst picture, The Adventures of Ford Fairlane. I will concede not everything Rennie Harlan touched turned to shit. He does actually have some good movies in his repertoire. But he still directed Cutthroat Island. And for that, he must die. Okay, that might be a bit extreme. Willis' star power did not translate into success for Hudson Hawk, however. It opened Memorial Day weekend to the tune of $7 million and only managed about $17 million during its entire theatrical run against a $65 million budget. Part of this could be due to strong competition from Backdraft, which opened the same weekend. It also may not have helped that at least one of the trailers primarily focused on the movie's action elements when it was first and foremost a comedy. And I'm sure it also didn't help that the movie just wasn't very good. Did it deserve to win Worst Picture? Let's take a look. For some reason, the film opens up with a story about Leonardo da Vinci with some glimpses at his study of flight, his commission from the Duke of Milan to craft a huge bronze statue of a horse, which was never completed as the bronze was repurposed for the war effort, and his painting of the Mona Lisa, and how the model apparently had really bad teeth. I did mention this movie was a comedy. I did not say the comedy was any good. But the main focus of the story is on da Vinci's work in the field of alchemy. Of course, da Vinci was not actually an alchemist, but this isn't a documentary. And honestly, this is the least of this movie's problems. According to the movie, da Vinci actually succeeded in turning lead into gold, but the secrets of his work were lost to time. More on that later, but first, we meet Willis as cat burglar extraordinaire Eddie Hawkins, otherwise known as the Hudson Hawk. According to Eddie, the Hudson part of the name comes from growing up in Hoboken, and Hawk is a slang term for a cold, biting wind. So he was named after inclement weather? Well, that's kind of stupid. Although, considering my own screen name, maybe I shouldn't be talking. Eddie has been doing time in Sing Sing and is about to get paroled, but he's quickly roped back into the cat burglar game by multiple people, including his own parole officer, no really, a crime family, a corrupt mega corporation, and the CIA. Oh yeah, they all want Eddie to start stealing shit again. And who is responsible for this insanity? You guessed it, Frank Stallone. I wonder how many people in my audience will actually get that reference. Stallone plays one of the heads of the aforementioned crime family, Caesar Mario, along with his brother Antony. And yes, the movie refers to them multiple times as the Mario Brothers. And believe it or not, there are characters in the movie with much sillier names. We'll get to that. We first meet the... Ugh, Mario Brothers when Eddie is trying to relax and enjoy a nice cappuccino until Antony suddenly shoots it. Believe it or not, Eddie trying and failing to get himself a cappuccino is part of a running gag that continues for the rest of the movie. Well, actually, I'd say it's more of a limping gag. Somehow, no one in the restaurant pays any attention to someone shooting a cup of coffee out of Eddie's hand, but they do pay attention a moment later when Eddie's partner in crime, Tommy, played by Danny Aiello, smashes a bottle over Antony's head. Really? That got everyone's attention. But you shoot a gun in the middle of a crowded restaurant and no one bats an eye? I know it's New York, but come on. Anyway, I mentioned earlier that Leonardo da Vinci was hired to make a horse statue but never completed the project, though he did make a clay model of the horse. And Eddie and Tommy have been hired to steal it from a local auction house. Okay, I know I just said this movie is not a documentary and I do not expect 100% historical accuracy, but my suspension of disbelief only goes so far. And there is no way anyone could possibly auction off the clay model of Leonardo's horse because it was destroyed centuries ago. When the French invaded Milan in 1499, they used it for target practice. I know they were French, but I doubt all of them missed. Anyway, this horse heist is absolutely baffling for a variety of reasons, besides the fact that there should be no horse to heist. First of all, there's another running gag about Eddie having an encyclopedic knowledge of song lengths. While they're planning the heist, and indeed throughout the film, Tommy rattles off various song titles and Eddie immediately responds with the song's length, or sometimes vice versa. 
I guess this is his way of keeping track of time. You know, they invented something while you're inside. It's called a watch. But this running gag, or limping gag, falls apart when you realize the lengths that Eddie gives for these songs are almost all incorrect. And ridiculously so. He claims Hit the Road Jack is 5 minutes 15 seconds. It's 2 minutes flat. He claims Swinging on a Star is 532, and it's about 230. And I think my favorite is when he says Whitney Houston's rendition of the Star Spangled Banner at Super Bowl 17 is 7 minutes and 17 seconds. Besides the fact that Whitney actually performed the anthem at Super Bowl 25, even Whitney at her Whitneyest would not take seven fucking minutes to sing the Star Spangled Banner. You're full of shit. Considering how far off these song lengths are, I'm quite certain Bruce was just throwing out random numbers. I don't know if that's what the script called for or if he just had a terrible memory, but either way, it's truly bizarre. Oddly enough, he does actually get one or two of them right, or at least pretty close, but even a blind squirrel finds a nut once in a while. The madness doesn't end there. After they break into the auction house and sneak by the guards on skateboards that they absolutely did not bring in with them. But I confess I don't think I've ever actually been to an auction house, so maybe they normally just have skateboards lying around. I don't know. They proceed to snatch the horse while singing out loud, swinging on a star because when you're trying to steal a priceless artifact and stealth is of the utmost importance, the best thing to do is burst into song. This man is supposed to be the greatest cat burglar who ever lived. I would hate to see who the worst one was. At least Bruce and Denny are decent singers, I'll give them that. And when they inevitably get busted by the guards and have to flee for their lives, they jump off the friggin' roof. And just as they hit the awning below, we immediately cut to Eddie meeting the Marios to hand over the statue. Can't come up with a way to explain how the characters miraculously survive? No problem. Just skip right to the next scene and let the audience fill in the blanks. It's not lazy writing. It's art. The weird thing is, the horse statue that Eddie and Tommy stole is somehow still listed for auction the next day. Eddie checks it out, and sure enough, they do have a horse statue for sale, though it's not the one he stole the night before. Here he meets Anna Baragli, played by Andy McDowell, an operative of the Vatican, along with filthy rich bastards Darwin and Minerva Mayflower, played respectively by Richard E. Grant and Sandra Bernhardt. The Mayflowers blow up the fake horse because... Um... That's never made clear, actually. I guess they just thought it'd be fun. What can I tell you? I'm the villain. This leads to a high-speed chase involving an ambulance and Eddie riding a gertie down the freeway. Don't ask. And then the ambulance explodes. Don't ask. And this is where things get convoluted as all hell. It turns out the Marios were working for the Mayflowers and their British butler, who, I swear to God, is named Alfred. First the Mario Brothers, and now Alfred. Who wrote this movie? Ten-year-old me? They want Eddie to steal two more Da Vinci artifacts, a codex currently in the possession of the Vatican, and a model of his famous helicopter. But it turns out the Mayflowers are also working with the CIA, for some reason. Led by George Kaplan, played by James Coburn, along with his associates... Uh... Sorry, I just... needed a second. <clears throat> along with his associates, Snickers, Kit Kat, Butterfinger, and Almond Joy. Yes, they're named after candy. Yes, that is David Caruso. And yes, they show each one of them eating their respective confections. Hey, that sponsorship money ain't gonna earn itself. Good lord, this is the most ridiculous and shameless use of product placement I've seen since Meet the Spartans. What's Coburn's code name, Milky Way? But to hear Almond Joy tell it, it could have been worse. Apparently, they used to be named after diseases. That's right, she changed her name to Almond Joy. Do you know what it's like being called Chlamydia for a year? It's a good change. And of course, one of the CIA goons is a complete imbecile. There's actually a scene where we see Butterfinger reading Dr. Seuss. Because as we all know, the one thing government agencies value above all else is incompetence. Actually, given the current state of politics in this country, I'm not entirely convinced that's not true. To further complicate matters, the Vatican is actually working with the CIA on this project. 
Don't even ask me to explain why they would knowingly work with someone trying to rob them because this movie already lost me about four scenes ago. But then we find out the Vatican is just pretending to help the CIA and is secretly working to stop the theft of the artifacts, the Mayflowers are secretly trying to double-cross the CIA and take everything for themselves, Anna is secretly a nun trained in counter-espionage, and that by itself could probably be a whole other movie, and Tommy was secretly working for the Mayflowers the whole time, Except that's not true, as he was double secretly working for the Vatican the whole time, and Jesus tap dancing Christ, Mission Impossible Fallout had fewer twists than this movie. And at least Mission Impossible Fallout was, you know, good. Anyway, throughout the film, Eddie constantly says he wants to go straight, and his thieving days are behind him. But it doesn't seem to take a whole lot of convincing to get him to steal both the horse and the codex. Eddie, they keep telling you you're the only one who can do the job. If you're really serious about this, call their bluff. At least hold out for more money or something. I do have my pride. And the Codex heist is completely ridiculous, as one might expect. It's surrounded by a laser grid, which Eddie bypasses using some mirrors. I confess I don't know enough to know if that would work in real life, but even if you could theoretically pull that off, I'm pretty sure the mirrors would have to be clean. Otherwise, they're not gonna reflect the laser. Either no one caught that, or no one cared. And I'm not sure which is worse. And after Eddie finally puts his foot down and says no more stealing for real this time, the CIA just go ahead and steal Da Vinci's helicopter model themselves. Well, if it was that easy, what the hell did you need Eddie for? And after all that nonsense, it's finally time for the reveal my master plan just before I kill you, Mr. Bond moment. The artifacts they stole are not actually what they're after. They want what's inside. The artifacts contain these large pointy crystals, even though they are obviously way too large to fit inside. Space is warped and time is bendable. And when the crystals are combined, they form... a bigger crystal! Okay, there's a bit more to it. It's the last piece of a machine Da Vinci invented that can actually turn lead into gold. Hilariously, the movie claims a bar each of gold and lead of equal size are indistinguishable by weight. Wrong, 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 wrong. On the periodic chart of elements, they're but one proton apart. Wrong, 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 wrong. I am not a chemistry expert by any stretch of the imagination, but even I know gold is noticeably heavier than lead, and they are three protons apart on the periodic table. Now, I know they didn't have smartphones back then, so they couldn't just reach into their pocket and pull up Wikipedia, but they did have, you know, libraries. They could have done the research if they wanted to. Well, the Mayflower's plan is to use Da Vinci's machine to create a ton of gold and flood the market, causing currencies the world over to plummet. Of course, this doesn't make much sense, since no one uses the gold standard for currency anymore, so let's add finance to the list of subjects this movie has failed. History, physics, chemistry, finance, is there any subject they can get right? How about basic addition? Do you think you can manage that? Two and a half minutes to save Anna, three and a half minutes to save the world. 600. Hey! You got it! Side by side? Hey! Not even close! But in the end, Eddie foils their plans by simply putting together the crystal wrong, and the machine blows up and Eddie and Anna fly to safety. And I guess they're a couple now, even though she's a nun. Sure, fine. And Tommy gets trapped in a limo and blown to kingdom come, but he walks it off. Cool, cool, very cool. And Eddie finally got his goddamn cappuccino. Good for him. And that's the plot of Hudson Hawk in a nutshell. As crazy as it is, it doesn't even scratch the surface of this movie's insanity. To really dig into that, you have to look at this movie's use of comedy. And I'm sure there will be plenty of people in the comments saying, oh, you just don't understand this movie. And to that I say... Well, of course I don't understand it. It's completely batshit. But I understand what it was trying to do. Hudson Hawk was attempting to be a surreal comedy, but that doesn't mean it did it well. Even though absurdist humor can seem random on the surface, under the hood there is actually a method to the madness. It's not as simple as just throwing a bunch of random shit at the wall to see what sticks. If it was that easy, we'd have a million Monty Python clones running around. And even the Pythons didn't bat a thousand. That's not to say the movie is completely unfunny. There are a few jokes that hit. On display for three days only at the Louvre in Paris. As opposed to the Louvre in Wisconsin? That was actually pretty good. And this was not. I guess we see who wears the penis in his family, huh? Get it? He said penis instead of pants. Ha! 
ha, 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 ha. But then there's stuff that's, I don't know if it's necessarily bad so much as puzzling. Hey, Mr. Hawk, you got your stamps. Good, Yogi. That was a Yogi Bear reference. Why was there a Yogi Bear reference? And how the hell did I end up reviewing two movies in a row with pointless Hanna-Barbera references? How did that become a thing? And there's the moment where Anna gets hit with a tranquilizer and it has some... side effects. I must speak with the dolphins now. You ever have one of those moments where you're not sure if the character in the movie got dosed or you did? And then there's David Caruso. Oh yeah, I didn't forget about him. He's probably the most interesting character in the movie. He has no lines of spoken dialogue and instead communicates through small note cards that were apparently printed ahead of time. You would think a pen and a small notepad would be simpler, but no, he has a shitload of pre-printed notes for every possible scenario. Now that is dedication to your craft. They never make it clear if he's actually a mute or if he just chooses not to speak, and given how weird this movie is, I'd say either is equally plausible, so I don't really know why he doesn't talk, and I don't know why he's miming along with Willis in this scene, and I really don't know why he dresses up like a fucking statue later on in the film, but I find it endlessly fascinating. I'm not sure why the Mayflower suddenly decided to kill him at the end of the movie. Must have been something he said. As far as the acting goes, for the most part, it's incredibly hammy and cartoonish, because Hudson Hawk is basically a cartoon. The villains are way over the top, the laws of physics aren't so much laws as polite suggestions, they even use cartoon sound effects to really drive the point home. Subtlety is not one of our strong points! But honestly, the performances almost save the movie. Every single person who shows up on camera is clearly having the time of their lives. I wish I was having as much fun watching the movie as they clearly had making it. Sadly, that was not the case. I thought it was stupid. Though I can kind of see why some people might enjoy it. Hudson Hawk knows exactly what it is and it's not trying to be anything else, and I'm sure its sense of humor will appeal to some. And like I said, I understand what it was trying to do. I just don't think it did it very well. For me, the humor missed more often than it hit, and overall it feels too childish for adults, but at the same time, too grown up for children. Hudson Hawk isn't what I would call a hard R, but for every cartoon sound effect, there's an F-bomb. And it just doesn't gel. The movie won Razzies for worst screenplay and worst director, which I am not about to argue with. However, Bruce Willis, Richard E. Grant, and Sandra Bernhard were all nominated for acting Razzies, and I will absolutely go to bat for them. Yes, their performances were ridiculous, but that was kind of the point. They played these parts exactly the way they were meant to be played, and their Razzie nominations are a joke. And of course, the movie won Worst Picture of 1991. And I'm gonna have to argue with that one as well. Sure, Hudson Hawk was bad, but was it anywhere near as bad as... Cool as Ice? Oh yeah, remember this one? If not, it's probably because your mind blocked it out as a defense mechanism, which is totally understandable. Or perhaps you never saw it in the first place. Not many did. This movie didn't flop so much as crumble. But anyway, for my money, Cool as Ice, a vehicle for inexplicably successful white rapper Vanilla Ice, is the worst picture of 1991. It didn't go overlooked by the Razzies, it was at least nominated for Worst Picture, and Mr. Van Winkle won a trio of awards himself. But how could anyone say with a straight face that Hudson Hawk was worse than this? At least Hudson Hawk had a star who could act. At least Hudson Hawk had a story that couldn't fit on a cocktail napkin. At least Hudson Hawk's director didn't disown the movie. Seriously, David Kellogg actually disowned this movie. Yeah, it's no contest. Cool as I should have won Worst Picture. Hudson Hawk is bad, but it ain't that bad. I don't know if there's anything here worth recommending, but if the bits and pieces I've shown you appeal to you at all, I suppose there are worse ways to spend an hour and a half. Just don't expect Citizen Kane. Speaking of expectations, next time we move on to 1992, and I really don't know what to expect. I haven't even heard of this movie. Like, at all. So that should be fun. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it.
You want me to rape him? 